Okay, we're back, and now we have Dennis Gray, who is a prose writer, primarily, mm -hmm. uh, currently from Woodmere, Long Island, but he was born in Kansas City, Missouri, a town mm -hmm. in which I almost got arrested once in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> which <Okay>. one? <laughs> uh, MCI. Oh, okay. Uh, the, uh, the main one, and uh, <laughs> that's a story in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Howard University. Mm -hmm. uh, how was Howard? Oh, fine. Last time I was there, <laughs> it was a fun idea. Uh, was it anybody I knew? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, okay, so writes poems. Well, mm -hmm. well, we were concentrating on the prose, I think, today. Short stories, one novella, 11 books, and two plays. Um, where do you find the time to earn a living? Well, that's a living, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, oh, <laughs> somewhere in the future. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was a banker, ex-banker, but I'm not uh -huh. going to name the bank. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I'm an ex. I'm an ex-banker too, but they didn't like the way I kept my money in the drawer. Uh, so oh, okay. <laughs> we don't want to get into that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, you go for the dramatic. Yes. In your mm -hmm. uh, in your writing, so uh, he's got a couple of prose clips to give us, and I think we better dive right into them. Okay. Okay. Take this it. is from. Uh, book called uh, No Other Choice. Is this a dirty book I was threatening? No. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's body was behind the steering wheel. His head had slumped into the steering wheel. Ellie felt the cold still derringer in her hand and then realized what she'd done. She began backing away from the car, still shocked by the two bullets she shot into Bill's chest to kill him. And then she turned around and ran back into the house, into the bedroom, into the dark where her body began to tremble and quake. And tears ran from her eyes, and she threw the gun across the bedroom floor, afraid of it, afraid of herself, afraid to move. I killed him. I killed him. I killed Bill, her mind repeated over and over again. Ellie looked over at the closet. She knew what she must do. She had to move Bill's body. She had to move Bill's body to another location. Ellie walked to her closet. She got her sweats out and put them on. Bill mustn't be found out there. Ellie removed her bicycle gloves where she could tie her sneakers, shoestrings better. Bill had to be moved, and then she went to the back porch. She put her bicycle gloves back on. He mustn't be found in front of the house. The blue bicycle came down off the hooks. Ellie rolled the bike into the hallway, leaned it against the wall, walked into the bathroom, and came back with two bathroom towels. I don't want to go out there, but, but I must. Ellie draped the two towels over the bike's handlebar. Ellie began rolling the bike. He's out there. Bill's dead. I, I, I have to stay calm, rational. Ellie got to the closet and put the parka on. I, I don't want to go out there. Ellie pulled the parka's hood over her head. Ellie rolled the bike to the door. Ellie turned to shut the door. The porch light burned. Ellie turned back around and rolled the bike along the short concrete path. Ah, ah. Ellie had to catch her breath. The car door was still open. Bill's head was still slumped against the car's steering wheel. The car's headlights still burned out into the fully born dark. I have to move him, don't I? Don't I? Ellie rested the bike against the side of the door. No, no, let me put the bike in the back, on the back, back seat first. Ellie opened the car's back door. She put the two towels over her shoulder. Then she grabbed the bike and laid the bike across the four-door sedan's roomy back seat with the handlebar snuggled into the back seat's leather upholstery and the tires facing out to the front seats. Ellie put one towel over each tire, just in case the tires touched against the back of the front seats and left dirt. That's perfect, Ellie said, gaining some sense of order. Ellie looked at Bill. He was next, she thought. Ellie shut the car's back door. Bill Applegate was a big man. Bill Applegate was a burly man. Ellie tried not to look at Bill as she tentatively pushed him. She tried not to look at Bill as her hands pushed tentatively at Bill's shoulders, but, but, but he didn't move, so Ellie pushed him harder and harder until she had him moving more away from the steering wheel, until she got him over to the corner of the car, and he sat up there rigidly like a big rolled-up rug that might topple. Ellie got in the car. She closed the car's doors. The, the keys were in the ignition. The car engine was off. N N Ellie knew how to drive. She last driven in Hollow Ring County. She saw how this big car worked. She would have to execute a new, another U-turn to head it in the right direction. Ellie did. Bill did not move. Ellie took a deep breath. Ellie looked for the car's high beam switch. She found it. She turned the car's lights on. Ellie kept the car's speed moderate. It's, it's warm in here. The car's windows were shut. Ellie took the parka off her head. The car cruised at its moderate acceleration. Ellie had reached the darker section of the drive where the moon had stopped shining through. It was as if the sky had dropped down on her. Ellie could not look over there. She could not look over to her right. He's, he's not there. He's not there. Bill's not there. Bill Applegate's not there. 
but Ellie could feel him. Ellie could feel him over there. She could feel him in the car, waiting it down, sitting up there. She could feel his shadow, something about him. There was something about him, something about him that she was feeling creepy. Ellie's bicycle gloves gripped hard to the steering wheel. She knew the, the car would be back out into the moon soon. Was he breathing? Was, was Bill Applegate was Bill Applegate actually breathing? Ellie could hear her, her sweat in her skin. Was, was he actually breathing with her? Was Bill actually, actually breathing along with her? Ellie wouldn't look. She wouldn't look over there. But then, then she, she twisted the car. The car twisted in the road. Eee! The body toppled from out its place. The body toppled from out its place. It fell across the car seat. Bill's eyes were looking up at Ellie. His eyes were looking up at Ellie, and Ellie was looking down at him into Bill's eyes. Ellie shivered. Ellie was terrified. She was terrified. She was looking into a dead man's eyes, a man she'd killed. The dark seemed to let her see those eyes, see them better than if there were a moon above. And the eyes stayed staring up at Ellie. Bill's head lay only inches from Ellie's leg. Ellie felt her insides turn funny, milky. She held her hand over her mouth and felt her stomach gurgle. The car moved faster. Bill's head jumped up and down on the car seat with the car's sudden propulsion. The big car moved faster and faster into the blanket of dark. She was there. She stopped the car. Ellie looked down at Bill. Bill's eyes looked up at Ellie. They were in the moon. Ellie opened the car door. She got out. She was in the glade. She, was, she walked over to the old oak tree. The car, the initials, were still in the tree. U and S. Dave, Dave, I, I've killed again, Dave. Darling, darling, I've killed again. Ellie touched the tree. He, he, he was, he, he was going to turn me in, Dave. Bill, Bill Applegate was going to turn me in. Like, and Ellie turned back around. She walked to the car. Ellie opened the car's back door. She moved the bike off the car seat and stuffed the towels into her pockets, pocket. She walked to the front door of the car and looked into it. Bill. She closed the car's door. The car's lights were shining. Ellie got on her bike. Ellie pulled the pocket over her head. It was hot. Ellie was warm. Ellie started pedaling away from the car on her bike, away from the old oak tree, away from the glade. She was pedaling as hard and as fast as she could on her bike, as powerfully as her legs could revolve through the bike's two pedals in one chain. Even in the dark, I know I, my way, Ellie thought. Even in the dark, I know my way home. And that's the end <laughs> of that. Alice, you're enthralled. <laughs> that, is, that is a wow. Um, the, the only thing for me is that uh, in my 20s, I used to have dates like that all the time. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> that's where I got oh. the story. <laughs> oh, is that where it came? That, I wanted to ask you about that. Yes. <laughs> this was before you met your wife. Right. <laughs> well, I would hope. Don't tell her that, though. <laughs> oh, she, she'll find out. <laughs> Even though she's in the audience right <laughs> She'll find out the hard mm -hmm. <laughs> Just wait till she gets you home. Yeah, uh, no. All right. Um, generally, um, so these these books are published, I trust. No, they, I hope to have them. I'm crafting now. I'm at the point where oh. I feel that I'm really capable of sending it to someone, and mm -hmm. I think I'm, I'm I'm doing that now. What kind of plays mm -hmm. do you do? Well, I've done uh, I've done one play, uh, two plays rather. Yeah. Uh, one uh, was from a short story, and we put it in play form. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, because of the actress, she did a, such a fantastic job. I've, I've written one for her, another one for her, uh -huh. and I'm working on one now. Yeah. So it have, sort of has a Beckett style to it. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, it's very spare, and I don't know what it's about yet, but I'm finding no, out. No dead bodies yet. <laughs> we talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's one of those plays. <laughs> all right, let me. Let but me. in a metaphorical sense. Uh, yeah, that's what they all say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you had another story. Yes, you uh, this to is from, from uh, a book uh, called A Long Stretch of Blue. The train stopped. The boxcar's door, door opened. Arthel and Blue Fire leaped off the train and rolled down onto the embankment. Arthel protecting Blue Fire and his suitcase in the special way his body would. When he hit the train this morning in the other town, the sun was sharp. Now the sky was a dark. Arfell stood up. He was told this was a big town, bigger than most. Already it felt like a town he could hide in, get lost in, move around in like a phantom. Arfell brushed himself off the fresh dirt off his jacket and trousers. He looked up at the dark sky. Blue fire, we're safe, blue fire, safe for now. Arfell walked up the embankment. The train was gone. He peered into the distance. He saw lights well beyond the tracks. Look around, blue fire. We, we're going to look around. Yeah, blue fire, it's, it's what we're going to do. And now Arthel and Blue Fire were at the edge of this town, about to enter it. He wanted to smell its fragrance as if the air belonged to him and Blue Fire alone. 
Smell it, blue fire. Smell it. it smell, smell how she smells. Arthel's feet moved lightly, politely settling to ground as if he were dust. And the more he moved into town, the more he saw. This is a city, he thought. This is a city. This is what people who've been north and come back south call a city, Arthel thought. Arthel saw buildings as tall as corn stalks and sugar canes. Arthel's eyes widened, and then Arthel stopped, and then he touched one of the tall buildings. See, blue fire? S see, it's real, blue fire. It's real, all real, Arthel said, looking up at the building as his eyes climbed. The night was slow in this city. People were walking as if mirrored reflections one or the other. Arthel moved his head, slanting it downward at a sharp angle, as if to hide it away. But no one passing was taking notice of him. No one would know what he was doing. But then Arthel slipped in and out of another shadow, for now it seemed more comfortable there. Already, for some reason, Arthel liked this city. Tall buildings, a lazy rhythm, eyes not looking farther than what they should. Ain't gonna have to do, do, do no explaining, Blue Fire, at least up north I ain't. He and Blue Fire had never been up north. It's why he smelled the air. He wanted to know if the air smelled any differently than what it did down south. But he sung about it and played about it on Blue Fire, about the freedom north but really didn't know anything about what blues, if any, a blues man could feel it had in his soul. But everybody had a story, and, it, and, it, and, 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 and he listened to those blues men tell theirs, and it spoke of freedom. Always spoke of freedom if this, as if there were no white men in the world, as if there were no rides in the dark, no white sheets, no trees for a colored man to hang from. This was the freedom north, the blues man sang of, a blues man sang of, of making him sing it too. The same song they sang, Blue Fire, Blue Fire. Did, did, did you hear Blue Fire? Did, did you hear too? Arthel turned around and looked back toward the train tracks. It's going south, Blue Fire, south. Arthel turned back around. Been there, Blue Fire, you and me. <laughs> We've been there, Blue Fire, Arthel said satisfiedly. Arthel and Blue Fire advanced more into this, this city, and to Arthel the lights were brighter, even though he still preferred the shadows, and the streets were paved better than what he'd ever seen before. Something rich about this town, Blue Fire, and it don't mind showing it. Arthel and Blue Fire were in another building's shadow shading them. And then this small figure leaped out from between the buildings. Shadows, startling Arthel. Arthel's hand went back to his back pocket, was halfway down when, hey, hey mister, you, you know how to play that thing, mister? It was a tiny colored boy, he had a cap on his head with his bill rolled up tight like a newspaper. Uh, uh, sure do, sure do, Arthel said, relieved his hand, leaving his back pocket and what was in it. The tiny colored boy circled Arthel and Blue Fire once and then twice for good measure. He, you got a name for it, Mr. Blue Fire? Blue Fire, Blue Fire. It sure is a pretty name. Sure is, ain't it? Tiny boy squirmed. Call me Roadmap. Roadmap, Roadmap. Ain't as pretty as Blue Fire, though. <laughs> pretty, pretty enough, though, Roadmap. Yeah, I guess so, guess so. Thanks, Mr. Thanks. Then Roadmap rolled his cat's bill with his hand. He looked at Blue Fire as if he heard the music Blue Fire played being strummed out of his steel strings and knew where the man in Blue Fire wanted to travel off to. Mister, mister, take, take, you, take you off to where you and Blue Fire could play the blues, mister. Where's that, Roadmap? Over on Bow Street, playing all night. Over on Bow Street, playing the blues all night, mister. Co cost you a dime, though. Roadmap took off his cap, stuck it out to Arthel, and then put it, his cap back on his head. Arthel chuckled. How about a nickel, then? Nickel's fine by me, then. How far we got to go to get over on Bow Street Road? My, oh, ain't but a mountain, mm, but maybe closer to two. <laughs> Arthel laughed. But before Arthel and Roadmap began their walk over to Bow Street, where the blues was playing, played all night, Roadmap said, May I touch her? Touch her, mister? Touch Blue Fire? And Arthel smiled. And Roadmap's head peeked behind Arthel's back, and his little hand went out and touched onto Blue Fire's skin. Oh, oh, mister, Roadmap said. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to have to let it go okay. with that. Um, uh, everybody's going to go out and buy okay. Dennis's books. Uh -huh. um, and if they're not published yet, publishers take note. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, there we are. I want to thank you both, uh, Dennis Gray and Alice Didier, for coming on Poet to Poet. And thanks to Tony Belize for letting us use the place. And we'll see you.